John, the first chapter. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be in Elmira. Um, I'm grateful to be invited, and this is my second time, so it's really great to be invited back. That's that's really a blessing. But I, I thank you. Uh, I, I appreciate the hospitality that I feel here, the good spirit, my kind of people. I uh, heard about a, a little boy that uh, was coming home from church crying. His dad said, why are you crying? He said, the pastor said he wanted me to be raised in a Christian family. He said, what's wrong with that? He said, I wanted to stay with you guys anyway, so I'm, I uh, would like to stay with you guys. Tonight, uh, I want to share <clears throat> something that God's put on my heart, and it has to do with how the gospel spreads. And um, um, it spreads, the most powerful way it spreads is by testimony. Now, I'm going to read some scripture from John, the first chapter, and um, I will start reading in verse 29. I'm reading from the New King James Version. And uh, I think that thing's heating up over there. Uh, we'll <laughs> we may turn this into a rebuking service here before you know it. I, I know the technicians are working as hard as they can. And um, if you need to unplug some things, including me, feel free. Mm -hmm. John 129 from the New King James Version. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, and he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should re uh, I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel, therefore I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. How many of you know you can actually see the Holy Spirit come on somebody? Yeah. And John said that. He said, I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. You know, God put a lot of confidence in John the Baptist's discernment to let him be the, the one who pointed out who the Messiah was. Uh, if his discernment had not been good, we might have followed the wrong one. But he, he was sent to prepare the way, and the way he knew was he could see the Holy Spirit come upon him. Again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples, and looking at Jesus, he walked and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned, and seeing them following, said to them, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which is to say, when translated, Teacher, where are you staying? And he said, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the tenth hour. Whatever you did was good. Uh, but it just undid. That's good. One of the two, uh, yeah, we got that one. That's good. Give me a little bit more on this one, but not if it brings that back. I can preach without one of these things if you get down to it. I think it might be tied to one of this, one of these. Cut it back down and see if it goes off. Y'all forgive us. We're just having a dialogue. It's the lights? Oh, okay. Well, good. Oh, well. Wait till I get through reading my scripture. 
<laughs> you turn out the lights and half this group will go to sleep. All right. We'll pick it up again. John 1, 40. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother. Say that with me. He first found, let's say it again. He first found his own brother. That brother's name was Simon, and he said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. That's a whole lot better. And he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah, or you are Simon Johnson. And you should be called Cephas, which is translated stone. You'll be called Rocky Johnson. That's, that would be a good translation, really. The gospel is good news. Let's say it together. The gospel... Let's say it with the emphasis on good news, all right? The gospel is, is good news. How many of you know people like good news? How many of you know people are not looking for religion? But they are looking for what? Good news. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you forgot very quickly some of you. All right. People, how many of you like good news? Do you like good news? I like good news. Good news travels fast. Of course, sometimes bad news does too. But we're all, in one way or another, news junkies. We... Um, we hear the news. Um, it's okay. You were all right before you started doing that. This is going to go on, folks. That's coming back, too. So uh, that just leave it kind of... I don't know who to talk to now. I've got several on there. Harold was a man I knew many years ago. He was about 6'6", six, six, and um, we were Baptists, so we baptized by immersion. And um, Harold came to our church because he wanted to hear the good news. And he decided that he should be baptized, and so Harold was longer than our baptistry. So I had to fold him up to baptize him. I'll never forget Harold because he was the kind of guy that would tell you exactly what he thought. If he didn't like something, he'd tell you. If he did, he would. And he had about a seventh grade education, but he was very talented. He could play music. He could do a lot of different things. He was the kind of guy you could easily get fooled about his intelligence by listening to him talk. And so Harold called me up one day, and he said, Brother Charles, do you believe the Bible? Now, he knew that I believed the Bible because he had come to our church because he wanted a church that believed the Bible. He said, do you believe the Bible? I said, Harold, you know I believe the Bible. He said, do you believe James 5.14? I said, sure. What does it say? He said, it says if anybody's sick, let them call for the elders of the church and let them come and Pray over him, anoint him with oil, and name of the Lord, prayer face, you'll save the sick. Now, I was a Baptist preacher, and I didn't remember ever having anointed anybody with oil before, or anything else for that matter. And uh, But I knew Harold. Harold was the kind of guy that wouldn't turn you loose. And so, I, okay, Harold, I'll be over there. So, But I didn't. I didn't know what kind of oil to use. I don't know if you use three in one olive oil or what you used. And so I went to the neighborhood drugstore, scared to death. One of my members was going to come in and ask me what I was doing. And I just said, well, I'm getting some salad dressing or something. I don't know. I, I mean, I was just embarrassed about, about, about the whole thing at that time. And so I got some olive oil, and I snuck out of the store with it, paid for it, of course. Went over to Harold's. And uh, there was Harold. He had back trouble, and, 
and he 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 was on the floor. He couldn't lay down in on a bed. He couldn't sit up, and it was just wall to wall Harold. And so I, I made a lot of small talk. And finally, Harold said, "Are you going to pray for me?" And, and I said, "Yes, you know." And, and I prayed one of these prayers where I gave God lots of caveats and options. And uh, I got through, and I I felt I felt really funny. Nothing happened, Harold. Harold was still in pain, and I backed out the door, saying, "Harold, I'd keep praying and so forth." And and I went home and I studied healing and studied about the prayer of faith and so forth. And um, because I knew Harold was gonna call me again. Harold's kind of those one of those kind of guys. Sure enough, next morning Harold called me and said, "Bring you all and come on back over here." I said, Lord, if you don't heal Harold, I'm going to spend the rest of my life praying for Harold every morning. <laughs> so I got more on. I said, this time, I, I'm going to pray differently. And so I poured all, all over Harold's head and slapped him on the forehead like old Roberts and said, in the name of Jesus, be healed. And I shouted. And uh, Harold got up. He said, I feel better. I said, I do too. <laughs> and um, But it, it, it was a new day for me. Uh, and it wasn't something I thought of. How I many of you know God can kind of put you in a corner somewhere, you know, where you don't have much of a choice? You have one, but it's not good. And um, so Harold became an evangelist. Preached in tents, what made me think of Harold. Harold preached in small towns across our part of the country. And uh, eventually Harold went to be with the Lord. I was driving through a little town the other day, and I passed a tent, and outside was the name of the evangelist. It was Harold's son. And I thought, you never know when God does something where it will stop. It just keeps on going. You know, the good news can't be squelched. It can't be put out. The most powerful thing in the world is a testimony. Now here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to cut to the chase. If you're, how many of you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? You're going to see your hands. All right, here's what I want you to do. Nobody's going to police you. It's up to you. I want you to take some time and write it out, how you came to Jesus. You know, sometimes, <clears throat> how many of you know that people don't get saved on doctrine? They get saved on the gospel. Now, I believe in sound doctrine, and, uh, but, but I'll tell you what, you don't, you don't reach people by, by preaching doctrine to them. You reach them by telling them what the Lord has done. There's a saying, John Sherrill said, the man with an experience is not at the mercy of a man with an argument. We don't reach people on arguments. At least that's been my experience. But you reach them with what Jesus has done. And sometimes we lay our testimonies aside in favor of picking up the religious arguments. And, uh, and that's, that's sad because the most important thing you have is your story. It's how the Lord reached you. And no two stories are alike. And there's as many stories as there are people in this room. Appreciate your story and review your story and tell somebody your story. Tell them, they can argue with your doctrine, but they can't argue with what happened to you. There it is. You know, whether you believe in healing or not, if somebody's been healed, there they are. Like my friend whose wife was, um, she's from Rochester, actually. She, she um, broke her back in an accident 22 years ago and a couple of years back, and she was wheelchair bound. 22 years, a couple of, couple of years back. God healed her, and there it is. I mean, people with uh, severed spinal columns don't get healed, but she did, and there it is. You know, you can have a, a debate about it, but there it is. Uh, it's like the blind man. When he was healed, he could see, and they wanted to argue with him. If you read John 9, <clears throat> and they called him before the court, the Sanhedrin, and, and they debated it, but 
you know, well, he's standing over the side, and they said, well, what, what are you doing? He said, I'm just looking around. You know, what do you do with somebody who has a testimony? Now, in this story that I've read to you, I'm going to point out three testimonies. And I want to say it again, give your testimony. A lot of Christians have never told anybody what the Lord did for them. And this is, we, we can't leave this up to the preachers and the worship leaders. We can't. My desire in the years that I have left is to activate individual Christians to do what God's called them to do. We have a commission. All of us do. It's not for preachers and missionaries. It's for everybody to go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples. Now, this, <clears throat> this story, I, I want to just... Um, Give a brief kind of overview. John the Baptist, I get over here. John the Baptist is an unusual character. He lives in the wilderness. He was filled with the Holy Spirit before he was born. I'd like to hear a doctrine on that. <clears throat> when Mary greeted Elizabeth, the babe leaped in Elizabeth's womb and the Bible says was filled with the Holy Spirit he grew up to be the forerunner and of course there was all kinds of prophecies that went over him as a baby uh, and he grew up to go out in the wilderness and preach down by the Jordan River and people from everywhere came out to hear him and he was a fire and brimstone preacher um, he, 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 uh, he got killed eventually because he rebuked the royalty for their sin. He rebuked Herod and his family. But he preached to the, to the clergymen and he called them snakes. You know, we need some straight talk. I said, we need some straight talk, don't we? I mean, you know that people are losing trust in all the institutions. And uh, John the Baptist was the kind of guy that would tell the truth. And even Jesus came out to, uh, to be baptized by John. And by the way, Jesus was baptized. I appreciate that uh, there'll be some baptizing. Now, John, when he saw Jesus coming, he saw the Spirit on him. He saw the Holy Spirit on him. Folks, we need to get to know more about the Holy Spirit. And he said, Behold, or look, there's the Lamb of God that does what? That takes away the sin of the world. And the next day, he said it again, and he baptized Jesus in water because Jesus insisted on it. And as Jesus is going away, two of John's disciples begin to follow Jesus. I don't know how many other disciples he had, but you know, if they had heard what he said... Their names might have been on the foundation stones of heaven too, but they missed an opportunity. I think a lot of times people miss an opportunity. But anyway, two of them didn't. One of them was named Andrew. And so Jesus is walking along, and he looks, and here's these two guys. And um, one of them says, where are you staying? And Jesus says, come and see. You know, Jesus doesn't always answer all our questions. He just tells us to keep following. Your question gets answered if you keep following. The Bible says we'll know the Lord if we follow on to know the Lord. A lot of us want answers before we follow. But he says, come and see. Say it with me. Come and see. You say, well, I don't like the looks of that tent. I don't like the looks of that church. I don't like the looks of those people. Well, you won't see if you don't come. <laughs> You get to know the Lord better if you follow on to know. And you can't be afraid, even though it gets exciting. Where are you staying? Come and see. So it was 10 o'clock. They spent the rest of the day, I suppose, with him. And, the, you know, I'd love to have the CDs of those meetings. How many of you like to spend about eight or nine hours with Jesus, you know, and just let him talk to you? Well, whatever he said, they were convinced. And so uh, Andrew goes and finds his, his brother, 
And he says to him, we found the Messiah. That is a what? Testimony. He gave his testimony. Say it with me. He gave his testimony. He didn't save Peter. He just gave his testimony. And Peter was drawn in by what Andrew said. And they knew each other pretty well, I'm sure. They fished together. They were brothers. And if Andrew said it, it had to be true. But, of course, Peter was the kind of guy that wanted to see for himself. And so he went. Now, when he went to see Jesus, Jesus looked at him. And he said, you are Simon. You will be a rock. You will be Peter. You are, you will be. How many of you know Jesus sees both? Real clear. He knows where you are, he knows who you are, and he knows what you will be if you follow him. He has his destiny, your destiny, in his mind. He knows what God made you to be. So that's what happened. Jesus gave him identity. None of us know who we are until the Lord tells us who we are. We're fearfully and wonderfully made, the Scripture says. Psalm 139 says, God knew you before you were born. You know the, the saddest thing is that most people will live their entire lives and never find out why they were born. Wouldn't that be sad? They don't know what's in their own heart. I, I've got to be careful because I'll jump off if, if, I, if I'm not careful here. But, but the, heart, there's, the heart knows things that the mind didn't tell it. The Bible uses hundreds of times, talks about the heart. It actually attributes thinking ability to the heart. Jesus looked into his heart. That's why God, that's why people get changed when they come to the Lord, because God shows them what's in their heart, and, and, and right off, that's not pretty. But he takes the weeds out of your heart and plants seeds in your heart based on what he has made you to be from the very beginning. And there's a release in Christ to be who you are, not to be religious, but to be who you are. God's not trying to make you what you're not. He's trying to release what he made you to be. Who would have ever heard of Peter if he hadn't have met Jesus? How many of you know Peter wasn't perfect? Oh, don't get me started. The professional Christian mentality is just a lot of junk. God loves people, and he, God, you know something God never says is, wow. <laughs> well, I didn't know that was going to happen. <laughs> I am shocked, Father, you know. <laughs> Maybe you don't know what I'm talking about. I don't know. God sees the end from the beginning. God's a redeemer. A lot, you know, we, <laughs> I'm jumping. I'm jumping off my outline. Forgive me. I'm sorry, but we're going to chase this rabbit. I'm telling you. Uh, <clears throat> you know, we sing these courses written by David. David would have a hard time holding a meeting in the church if he was alive today. Are you here? Are you, are you breathing now? I said, you know, we love Abraham. Have you studied Abraham real carefully? Abraham wasn't saved because he was always righteous. He was saved because he believed God. How many of you love me before I go any further with this? I just, I want to be sure, thank you. Now, the rest of you just don't listen. I, I'm, 
the religion has given us a false idea of who God is and who Christians are, and we don't understand that God, when he calls you, knows you better than you know yourself, and he's made a covenant with you, and he'll walk with you if you continue to love him, and he'll redeem you out of your evil. You know, we'd get saved, join the church, and then we can't stand anybody. We walk around like we never sinned, and God help the person who does. Now, what, what I'm trying to say to you is that the Lord knows us when He calls us. I, I don't know if you believe me or not. Some of you do, I believe. I didn't want to be a preacher because I knew I couldn't live up to it. I think I kind of admitted that last night. I, but I didn't want to be. I knew I couldn't live up to the expectations of people. And sure enough, I didn't. And, uh, you know, the fact is, I didn't really want to. That's what really made it bad. <laughs> and I was a preacher's kid. My son, of course, is a preacher's kid. He said all preacher's kids need therapy, and I think he's right. <laughs> because of expectations. Wow. Boy, I went way off on there. Jesus gives identity. Say it with me. Jesus. Let's say it again. Jesus gives identity. Do you think he knew that Peter wasn't going to be 100% perfect? How many of you know some of the things Peter did wrong after that? Yeah, read them. Go ahead. I like to read them because it gives me a little comfort. I'm glad the Bible's an honest book. Do you know the Bible just... It just puts people's sin right in there. <laughs> I'm sorry, Lord. I, I, I don't mean to dwell on that, but, but not, not that that gives us license to sin, but I'm telling you, you, you need to think about it so we can live with each other and love one another as God loves us. And, and here's Peter. Peter... You know, Jesus says, I'm going to go be crucified. And Peter takes him aside. Isn't it, wasn't that nice of him? He took Jesus aside. He didn't want to embarrass Jesus in front of the other disciples. And he said, that's not true, Lord. You know, that's not true. That'll never happen to you. And Jesus looked at him and said, I rebuke you, Satan. Man, it, he felt a great emptiness. You know, he, he, he's, he's advising Jesus. If, you know, if the, if the Lord knew that's the kind of guy he was going to be, he could have said, yeah, you're Simon, but I don't want any part of you. You're going to be giving me trouble. You're going to be denying me on the night that I get crucified. But he loved him. I love to read about Peter. I love to read his epistles as he talks about what the Lord meant to him. You know, God gave him identity. God gave all of them identity. He called James and John sons of thunder, not because they preached loud, but because they had bad tempers. And they didn't get over it the minute they got saved. I like to read about that. It gives me a little comfort. You know, you know James and John, he sent them out to, be, uh, to, to, uh, to see if a, a, a village would let, them come, let him come and hold meetings there. And so they went, and, and, and the village elder said, No, we don't want Jesus to come here. And James and John went back to Jesus and said, Let us call down fire on that city. Praise God. We'll burn them up. <laughs> and Jesus didn't say, Well, you're no longer my disciples. He just said, You don't know what spirit you're of. Jesus gives identity. Say it with me. Jesus gives identity. Now, he may say it one day. It may take you years to figure it out. But sooner or later, he will show you who you are, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And he'll show you that he loves you. And that will humble you. The testimonies in this story, and I could have kept reading because there are more testimonies, but I'll just mention these. John the Baptist's testimony was, I saw the Spirit on him, and he's the Lamb of God. Now, that's the gospel. What he testified to was the gospel, the good news. Jesus 
is the Lamb of God. Say it with me. Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Isn't that good news? He'll take away your sin. You say, well, I've done some like uh, Abraham did or David did or Peter did or the others did. He'll take it away from you. He'll take your guilt away. My goodness. And then there's Andrew's testimony. We have found the Messiah. That's his personal testimony. I have found the one who takes my sin away. His personal testimony. And then there's another testimony, and that's the testimony of Jesus. Now, Revelation 19.10 says, The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now notice, not prophecy, but the spirit of prophecy, the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus prophesied over Peter. He said, you are Simon, you will be Peter. That was a, pro that was a prophecy, and it was a true prophecy. You were, and you will be. Now, there are three testimonies. One is the testimony of the gospel that John gave. The other is a testimony of, of personal experience that Andrew gave. And the third one is the testimony of the Holy Spirit of prophecy that Jesus gave. These are three testimonies in this story. Now, if you go on, you'll see the testimony of Philip, who also met the Messiah. Jesus went looking for him. And then you'll see the testimony of Nathaniel, that Philip invited him, and then Jesus prophesied over Nathaniel. Just one testimony after another. Saints, we've got to get out of being professional Christians and start testifying to what the Lord's done. It would change any community. If God's really done something for you, you know, I, I, I take something called melatonin. It's a over-the-counter thing to help me sleep. Now, I'm a light sleeper, and for years and years and years, I seldom got a good night's sleep, and melatonin's not paying me for this anyway. And so, a friend of mine sent me a book years ago called The Melatonin Miracle, and um, it had helped him. And he said, this has helped me to sleep. So, I went to the store, and I bought some melatonin. My wife and I took some melatonin. I took it's a three milligram tablet, and uh, it's a natural substance because your body produces it, but as you get older, it quits producing as much, and then finally it doesn't produce any, so you can't sleep good, and older folks a lot of times can't sleep good. So I wasn't sleeping too good. Now, this is like 20-something years ago. So I took a three milligram, and I slept so hard, and my wife took and she slept so hard that our burglar alarm went off and we didn't even hear it. And the neighbor called and said, is everything all right over there? Now the wind had blown the door jar and that's why the alarm went off. Now, I have sold more melatonin than any pharmacy you know of because I just tell people, they say, well, I don't sleep good. I said, well, try melatonin. Now, I don't get a thing out of it. Nobody's ever paid me for it. You know, and I may never mention in a meeting like this again, but I'm giving you a testimony. Now, by the way, if you take it and it doesn't do you any good, don't talk to me about it. I'm just telling you, it helped me, see. Testimony, say testimony. How many of you know that the best advertisements are those that have a testimony? You say, well, if it worked for so-and-so, maybe it'll work for me. And they pay people to testify. Usually it's not the person that actually got the testimony. But you've got the greatest testimony in the world. Your life was changed. Your sins were forgiven. You've got heaven now. What in the world more could you ask for for God to do? Testimonies. My testimony is... I was a preacher's kid. I hated church. I hated church when I was real little because mother made a cake for the church supper and they ate the whole cake. 
I was only five years old. Learned to hate the church. She said, you can have some if they don't eat it all. They ate it all. I learned to hate the government when I was 11. They took 60 cents out of my paycheck. Social Security and income tax. I learned to hate the government when I was 11 years old. I was a pretty bad little dude there for a while. And, and one night, we had a long, tall preacher from Texas. My dad was kind of short. And this guy went into church, wasn't all that big. And when he leaned over the pulpit, he was just about to the front row. And then he'd take his long arm and his long finger and he'd point at you. Seemed like he was pointing at me no matter where I sat in the, in the place. And he loved to preach about hell. He could preach about hell like he just got back. I'm telling you. I began to have nightmares. Now, somebody says fear is not a good motive, but I'll tell you it beats no motive at all. Now, the Lord saved me. That's just kind of a thumbnail sketch. You've got a testimony. When's the last time you gave it? Did you ever tell somebody that was having problems, here's what changed my life? What would happen if all the Christians in this area released their testimonies? I'm going to close. I want to give you these lessons. Um, I'll give you, I'm just going to run through about seven of them. One, the good news spreads through testimonies. The good news spreads through testimonies. Let's say it together. The good news spreads through testimonies. That's how the good news makes it. It's not through preaching doctrine. Although I'm for good doctrine, I'm just saying that's not how the good news travels. The good news travels by testimony. The testimony, number two, that is given here is we have found the Messiah who takes away sin. I love Isaiah 53. He was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement of my peace was upon him. And with his stripes, I was healed. Hallelujah. Number three, people need guilt removal. People need guilt removal. Say it with me. People need guilt removal. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you have guilt. You know, everybody has to deal with guilt. It could be over something you said or something you did or something you didn't do. But psychologists will tell you that guilt's a bad thing. And everybody has to deal with it. Some deal with it better than others. The best way to deal with guilt is get rid of it. Well, how are you going to do that? Well, here's how, here's how postmoderns get rid of it. They say there's nothing right or wrong. Everything's amoral. Well, that may sound good to some folks. We just know it isn't true. And then along comes somebody and blows up the Twin Towers, and we say, that's evil. Yeah, hello. There is evil, isn't there? Somebody molests a baby and you say, oh, that's evil. Somebody steals something that belonged to someone. That's evil. Yeah, there's a lot of evil. There's guilt. I don't believe in our morality. I don't believe morality is whatever you want it to be. Any more than the North Pole is where you want it to be. If I'm flying on a plane, the pilot says, how many of you feel like we're flying north? I say, land this plane as quick as you can. I want to get off of here. If you, if you don't know where north is, I don't want to fly with you. You know, gravity is not how you feel about it. You know what? If a person feels good about it and a person feels bad about it and they jump off a building at the same time, they'll hit the ground about the same time. It doesn't matter how you feel about it. We've got to get over feelings being the, the defining issue. Feeling is not. Reality is. So our morality is not a good way to get rid of guilt. Some people say, well, I'll bear my own guilt. Well, I feel bad for you because it will make you sick. 
It'll destroy your life. There's another way to get rid of guilt, and that's let Jesus take it. He died for it. There's no need for you to carry it around. And when you say, Lord, I trust you to take away my sin, oh, praise God. I trust you to bear my guilt. You know, he may tell you to go apologize to somebody. He may tell you to do something, but I'll tell you what. He'll never have to die again. He's already done that once and for all. And I'm thankful I don't have to make an offering for my sin every week. Praise God, it's been done. Amen. A fourth lesson I see here is go to those closest to you first. Go to those closest to you. God's done something in your life. If you've got a brother, sister, parent, somebody, go to them. A lot of people find it's easier to go to Africa or go to South America than it is to go to the clo those closest to them. But go. One of the first things I did when I met the Lord was go to my brother. And he accepted Jesus. He became a judge. He died five years ago. Wrote me a beautiful letter and thank me for leading him to Christ. Go to the one closest to you. Then go to others. He first found his brother. Here's another. Look at people beyond where they are. How many of you know life is not a photograph, it's a movie? You see somebody today and you say, oh, I don't like that person. Well, what? give them some time. God may have something yet going on in their life. He said, you are Peter, but, I mean, you are Simon, but you will be Peter. Jesus saw, aren't you glad he sees beyond where you are? We all form opinions real quick. I do. You know, you look at somebody and say, oh, I don't like that. Well, that's not how God looks at people. We need to see the Lord at work. There used to be a bumper sticker. He's not finished with me yet. And that's true. Well, two more real quick. You don't save people. The gospel does. You say, well, what if they don't hear me? What if it? Listen, don't try to be the Holy Spirit. You're not. You don't have to persuade people. It's good to be persuasive. But what you do have to do is tell them what happened. Let the Holy Spirit... The farmer doesn't make the plant grow. The seed does. He plants the seed, and the seed and the soil take over. But the farmer doesn't grow something. The seed does. Sow the seed. You know, they may say no, but the seed will have been sown. Then let the Lord deal with it. And finally... There's two types of evangelism that I see here. One is come and see, and the other is go and tell. They said, where are you staying? He said, come and see. And then they went and told. Seek the Lord. Follow the Lord. And what he shows you, tell somebody. If you want to you remember something yourself, tell somebody else. If you want to be blessed... Share it with somebody. I'm blessed as a minister because I, I get to share whatever the Lord's saying to me all the time. It's a great honor and a great blessing. But you can do it. Some of the best moments I have is when I'm sitting around guys and the Lord says, you know, the, uh, somebody will say, you know, the Lord showed me something. Fellowship's a wonderful thing. We can share the life of Christ. If somebody wants to know something, sometimes a good thing to say, well, just come and see. And when they see something, they'll go and tell, you know what I saw? The gospel spreads through testimonies. I, uh, I suppose different ones will hear different things in this message. But I hope you hear one thing. Give your testimony. Give your testimony. Now, just sit right here and say, Lord, I'm going to give my testimony. I may just screw it up really bad. 
but I'm going to do it. I'm going to, if I have to pay somebody $20 to sit and listen, I am going to tell what, what you did for me. I'm going to do what, I may believe the Holy Spirit would want us to give our testimonies. You know? All right, so let's just obey the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, you know, if you have to look at the wall and practice, but give your testimony. And, you know, something's going to happen. You're going to have a new testimony. 